And we are live. So, uh, hi, everybody. I'm Larry Bafia. I'm the director for the 2018 SIGGRAPH Computer Animation Festival. And I'd like to welcome you to Facebook Live, our director Q&A. And today we'll be chatting with Patrick Osborne. Um, hi. I, welcome, Patrick. I'd like to invite everyone out in the audience to uh, type in your questions in the comment box so that we can share them as we move along in the conversation. So we're celebrating Oscar week, and Patrick is no stranger to the uh, Academy Awards. Uh, having been involved with Paper Man as an animation supervisor, uh, with John Cars as the as a director, lovely film, as well as winning for Feast in 2015, and then being the first time nominee for an animated short in VR with Pearl. So I'd like to discuss uh, a number of things there as well. Uh, I'd also like to mention that we're celebrating the fact that the submissions are now open for the Computer Animation Festival. So all of you folks out there that have any kind of short films, as well as VR films, uh, the submissions are now open, as well as several of the other programs. So just go to s 2018 siggraphorg slash submissions, and you'll get all the info on that stuff. So glad to have you here this afternoon. Um, we finally got you on video after a, a couple of things going on, but you know, it's <laughs> the world of technology, I guess. Um, yeah, I think the, the studios now after various leaks and hacks are a little tighter with their web servers. So, um, you know, but that's fine. It's working. <laughs> that's okay. We, we broke the wall. <laughs> um, so Feast was your first really big directorial for a, for a short film and made it all the way to the Academy Awards. Why don't you take us uh, through a little journey on, on how uh, you went through the concept of that film and, and kind of worked out the story? Yeah, for sure. I think, uh, you know, well, SIGGRAPH for me has been around in my animation uh, like sphere since school, because back at, at school at Ringling, it was the target. Uh, the Computer Animation Festival was the... Uh, the thing that you were aiming for at the end of the year with your final film project. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, so uh, thanks for having me on. It's been a part of, uh, kind of my computer animation world since then. Um, you know, the feast thing happened when, uh, Disney, um, back a couple years ago, well, it's a while now, probably six years ago when they decided to, uh, start doing the, the shorts program again, um, Pixar have been doing it for a while. I think Disney had done dabbled in a few shorts years ago. Uh, Paper Man was a force, you know, a, a, a product of, of the will of John Carr's to get that one going. It wasn't a part of any kind of pitch program or anything, and uh, at least not at Disney. I think it was back at Pixar when he worked there. So Disney was the first one that, or P Feast was the the first film out of the official shorts program there when it got started, and it was the kind of thing where. Um, they basically opened up the floor uh, to hear pitches for potential shorts to go in front of movies. Just the idea to grow talent and technology and artistic tools. And um, I'm the kind of person who believes that you should uh, at least try that kind of thing. I mean, the rule was uh, you had to pitch three things. Um, and you would pitch the story trust first, a group of directors, and uh, heads of story and producers, and then they would choose a few to pitch to John Lasseter, and that was how it was going to be made. And um, you know, it, it was it was a it's a hurry up and wait kind of thing, like a lot of things are in movie making in some ways, where it's like you put in your name that you're interested, and in, they're like, "Great, uh, next week, let's hear what you got," and that instantly is a little bit stressful. Uh, but generally, with those things, I, I tend to just kind of say, okay, that's what I'm pitching, and try to work towards that deadline, knowing that it might move, you know, and not to take it personally if it does, and it moved a couple times, and I think, you know, the whole pitch process was four or five months of, uh, you know, getting a meeting, and then it getting moved. Uh, these, these short pitches tend to not be the most high priority for, uh, for things like that, so, uh, you know, so I think, you know, you just expect it to get moved around, and that's, that's cool, but then uh, in May, of that year, I started pitching in December of the previous year, and in May they decided to uh, green light it for the, in front of Big Hero Six. I was the co-head of animation at Big Hero Six at the time with Zach Parrish, so I had to uh, tell Zach, you know, I am uh, 
sorry, I'm I'm done. And he, you know, was okay with that. Uh, it became <laughs> Z- Big Hero became Zach's movie, and uh, I moved on to this. And it was um, a year later. It was out in Annecy, and quite a ride after that. So uh, a lot yeah, of fun though. Well, you know, that, that's one thing that the other directors have been talking about is uh, it's amazing what an impact it is to even be nominated for an Academy Award and how it really kind of shakes up, shakes up your world and all of a sudden other doors are opening and for some reason people are interested. <laughs> yeah, it is. It it's changes everything. It's, uh, you know, I don't, I think getting that kind of, uh, exposure changes everything in the first place. So just having a short in front of a Disney film that's playing on millions of, of uh, in front of millions of people is the first uh, thing that that changes everything. And then any little any bit of notoriety or success after that is definitely nice and definitely builds on that. And it's true the doors kind of swing open in a lot of ways, uh, but you know it's it's stuff that you got to weigh carefully because the the animation business is small and uh, you got to be careful not to burn bridges as you jump around as well so uh, it's it's definitely been interesting and fun trying to learn that whole new side of the the job in the industry yeah well well, it's interesting because i mean you know working for disney and paper man and then feast you know fairly traditional pipelines and all but then you step into google spotlight stories which really isn't a traditional animation studio. Um, how did you address walking in and talking to a bunch of Google guys about how to do 360? Well, it was really Karen uh, Dufalo, who uh, is one of their uh, executive producers, and Jan Pinkova, who did uh, Jerry's Game and uh, was the was the director who started Ratatouille. Um, they, I met them at Annecy for lunch. Uh, and I'd never met either of them before, but they were they're big uh, believers in kind of supporting one particular creator for whatever they are passionate about and want to do, as long as it lines up with uh, something that that Google and Spotlight Stories is interested in pursuing. Kind of, you know, as long as your intentions kind of align, it seems like they're they're the they're an awesome team to kind of uh, jump on board with. And they were interested in just hearing, talking creatively, hearing what I would be interested in doing, and um, you know, well, I, it, at that point I was still working at Disney and not really, um, even considering going anywhere. So it's the kind of thing that kind of stays in the back of your mind is a, a, a potential option. And a lot of other things kind of pop up that are similar and they start to, you know, weigh on you a little bit and you start to kind of weigh the, the value of non-exclusivity of that kind of situation where you can kind of start to build yourself as a creator uh, independently, and that seemed like a cool thing. So they were willing to kind of uh, be a little bit of my creative parachute and be this great uh, team of people that were willing to uh, support something I wanted to do, but also kind of uh, l- let it be a part of my creating, you know, my own version of, of what I was going to be as a director and uh, outside of any kind of preconception of a studio. Once kind of um, neat about Google is that is exactly that they don't really have a full team there uh, at at their uh, Mountain View office to make anything. So you really have to uh, get friends together and and try to um, build a team on your own, which is really fun. Um, it's challenging when you've worked in a studio for the last seven years and all of your network is in one place and employed exclusively. So I went to Twitter and Facebook and found, you know, like Tuna Bora, who was the production designer of that, who's a super talent, who's just uh, starting out directing her on her own right now, and um, and other people like that. And they brought in Cassidy Curtis as their, uh, as one of their uh, people from, from PDI, which had recently kind of dissolved up there in the Bay Area. And so there was mm-hmm. a, a really kind of neat mix of finding artists and people to help all around the world through Twitter, through uh, Instagram and Tumblr, uh, just people that looked like they'd be interesting to work with and were freelancing and we could kind of call. So a lot of the work was done like this over uh, yeah. video chat, uh, which, is, which is great. And, and there weren't any of the cool VR tools that are there now. So it was a lot of just Photoshop and kind of faking it and doing like little Maya models and, and kind of halfway getting to 
uh, versions that you kind of understand what you were doing, but it, it, there wasn't a lot of the cool prototyping and VR that exists now, which which would help a lot. Yeah, I, I was curious as to you know how familiar were you with 360 films before you were approached? And have you watched many at all? I mean, only Spotlight Glenn was just kind of coming up. Yeah, the only Glenn Keane's duet had I seen. Yeah, and it was that day they were showing it. At Annecy as well, right. so I, like they handed me the phone and I got to watch a little bit of it like that. But it wasn't um, I, pretty much none. So surprise, but, in 360. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it was it, what interested me about it, it was the em- emerging Oculus Vive VR world. I had done I had tried a few of the dev kits when I was working at Disney. They had a little you know demos here and there. You could kind of see the future. The VR thing and that could, how that could be potentially pretty cool and immersive. So the whole time I was thinking about making it not something that was locked in completely to 360 from the beginning, um, mm-hmm. so that we could put it into a six, you know, six duff uh, headset and actually have an experience there too. So that was part of the uh, the goal of that. As I was thinking of it, like that, I wanted there to be a, a high end VR, a 360, and uh, a film version. Yeah. To see, you know, it's the kind of thing where it's like they're they're willing to fund this kind of experiment, and it's amazing, and it's a little art project, and I wanted to use it for my own like research of like how stories read differently when you have this headset you put on you're in the world versus 360 versus a regular film. Mm-hmm. See if you if you could see the same story in three different ways, you might learn something about each of those mediums. In a, in yeah. A, and I think you kind of do. So it's uh, it was cool that way as an experiment. I thought it was interesting the way you use the car interior as well. So you kind of, in a lot of ways, constrain the viewer where you, you could pick up the main action quickly. And, you know, when the song's playing or whatever, you could also look around or whatever. I'm, I'm sure you planted a few Easter eggs in there, though. There's a few, but we tried to make sure that we spent our time in, you know, and therefore money on uh, the things that were most important to the story. And uh, a lot, there are Easter eggs in production design and stuff like that, you know, like what the band's names of the kids' t-shirts are. You know, we had fun with like what we were actually doing there, but it was, uh, you you want to make sure that like the real important stuff is what you get. And mm-hmm. there's, yeah, there's some, but there's not a ton. It's just uh, a few little things. <laughs> So, so did you storyboard in a traditional sense, or did you kind of stretch out the world and see what was going yeah, on? Yeah, I storyboarded in a 180 uh, kind of wraparound uh, Photoshop file, you know, that you could kind of... They, they had a few little tools <clears throat> at, at Spotlight Stories that they were, um, you know, kind of developing uh, as we were making this, and one of them was the ability to kind of get a do a little bit of storyboarding like drop some images in 3d space and move them around with your finger on the phone uh and it was all just kind of you know duct taped together for the purpose of trying to get a a feeling out of how things were going to cut but the one that was most effective for me was just kind of building block layout really simple blocky shapes playing that along with the song and hoping that worked um but it, it was definitely a little harder to sell on the, you know, there's a lot of hand waving when you say it's going to be emotional and great when actually shots play one after another, because that's the thing that had to be optimized before it worked. So, you know, as we're working on it, each shot, there was a second pause between them. Mm-hmm. And that kind of takes it out. And you just have to, like, try to train your brain to look beyond that pause, you know. So how long were you iterating on the film? Uh, that was, let's see, we did about six weeks of proof of concept, just like working on a, a rough test. And then I think we worked on that for the next like seven months after that, mm-hmm. uh, back and forth. And then we did the final, like final version played to the following March. So it went from about April to March. So probably about a year in total working on that. And then, um, and then definitely a lot of, uh, you know, touring around and, and showing it to people and going to festivals and stuff after that, which was really, yeah. really fun part. So were, were there things that you had to cut out where, you know, the, 
you know, Cassidy and, and the tech team are tapping on the shoulder and saying, we'll never be able to optimize that or we got to find some tricks and, or, um, yeah, I mean, not exactly. your production design was pretty straight ahead to kind of work things out. Yeah, we were designing for the purpose of the the, the look of the film. Well, uh, Tuna has some of her illustration is uh, very geometric and, and and broken down and and abstract. So it really helped to start with someone who kind of got the that kind of look. And I thought that her look would be able to be transferred pretty easily onto this real time rendering system which is a, a challenge for a lot of realistic looks. But if you're going to be a little bit abstract and um, impressionistic with your polygons, you can actually do it on mm -hmm. a pretty low-end you know, processor. And then, uh, yeah, we were designing, the, the story was kind of written around the, the way, on the, on the way it was going to be made. So there wasn't really, I don't think there were any like real limits as far as that goes. There are limits on how many characters can exist moving, um, you know, how many polygons you can actually move around a, a scene, but we never were really calling for like huge crowd stuff. Mm -hmm. you know? So I think that it was okay. We did have quite a lot, um, you know, quite a lot of stuff going on. Cool. Um, um in, what, in, about the, what about the, what the, about the song? Um, what's, what's the, the story behind that? Cause obviously that plays a huge role in, in the film. No, it was cool. It was uh, um, the the uh, I I love. I'm a folk music fan, and I love going to South by Southwest every year or when I can. It's not every year anymore, but um, and seeing like a lot of new music, and I I wanted to make this kind of VR folk musical thing because you know Google was willing to do it mostly, and I uh, didn't think anybody else would. So it seemed like kind of a cool thing to do. And uh, they partners with us with uh, Pollen Music, which is uh, Scott Stafford, J.J. Weasler, and uh, Alexis Hart. They're partners in this music group in San Francisco. And they, um, you know, it was really cool that they took my story and then they took a little bit of my inspiration. And, uh, and they took a couple bands that I'm really big fans of. And we got about 10 demos from artists who were, uh, who were uh, inspired by the writing and the original like idea and um, wrote songs. So I, I got to listen to 10 or so demo songs. And I ended up loving the one that Alexis had actually written. It was a blind taste test. They didn't tell me who wrote what, so I wouldn't be swayed by fandom. And uh, they, um, but then I loved, uh, I loved J uh, or I loved Alexis's song and I loved uh, Nikki Bloom's voice for mm -hmm. our, our girl. So we ended up um, combining one demo with the singer of another song and making that be what it was. Uh, and it's, it's awesome. Nikki Bloom and, um, uh, was, was singing the female part of that song. It was cool. cool. So, uh, we've got a question from the audience here. Uh, if you can bring that up. It's for storytelling in VR. Do you have any advice on guiding the audience where to look and, uh, also cutting? Yeah, well, I knew that, um, you know, when we started this, everyone, there was a lot of talk about this kind of stuff. Can you cut? Can you um, do an interactive story that works, that it, it, that feels cinematic? And I think cinematic is different in VR than it is on in a, in a movie. It's mo much more like a play. Um, I made a few story choices that I think help you get around a few of these ideas. One of them is that it's in a car and it's meant to be seated. So when you think about a seated performance, most people aren't. Uh, well, this isn't really true, but you know you're supposed to, you're not really always sitting in a swivel chair. So the idea is that you're looking about 180 degrees is like where most of the stuff happens. And when you go to a, a play, you kind of understand that too. We all get the idea that like, oh, the stage is this way. Maybe some stuff will come down the aisle, but we're supposed to be looking in this direction. So there's that that is like a a kind of guiding principle. And then the same thing with stage where you kind of guide, uh, you guide the audience to look at actors by having them move, having lights shine on them and having them uh, say things. All those, the audio cue, the visual lighting cue and the movement cues are all used to guide the eye. Um, and then I think it's important if you think about, you have to train an audience to watch things, especially when it's an early VR thing. It's going to get less and less as people get used to this stuff. 
But the first shot or two is actually telling the audience what to expect. So we understand that you can't start cutting fast right away in the first shot because you want people to kind of look around and settle and then say, oh, there's one thing to follow. I kind of get this. If I look over here, it's not as exciting as over here. So you try to like have all the, all the breadcrumbs leading towards the audience looking at the right spot. And then you can cut, and they're like, oh, I'm in a new place. And we, when you watch people watch it, they, they do look around for the first couple shots. But once they start to realize that cuts are going to keep happening and that I'm not moving the point of focus massively, uh, you start to get that, you know, people start to kind of lock into it and watch what you want them to watch. Um, I, there was talk of uh, trying to get the audience to, like, stand up and spin around and... Can we like start to say, oh, it's each cut's going to be a little more to the right, so we start to influence them to turn. Uh, there's ways to do stuff like that too, potentially, but with it being mainly a 360 thing where you weren't going to be able to do the stand up or kind of turn around stuff as easily, it felt like we probably shouldn't push it that far with this particular story for now. Um, but there's all those kind of things, and then for me, you want to make sure that you understand what makes people sick, and that acceleration is not a great idea, and that it's good to have anchor points that are consistent shot to shot so you're not feeling like you're disoriented constantly unless that's what you want them to feel. So the, the idea of putting it inside of a car was really a framework to give a frame within a frame for the whole story so we can get nice compositions and also have people understand which way was forward and backward and, um, and that kind of stuff and not disorient. But I think you can cut not that way. It's just you realize that audience is going to want to settle themselves into where they are for every shot. And that takes some time, so the pace of things is different. When we cut the uh, the film version that went to the Oscars and stuff, that one uh, um, had twice as many shots because if you watch a film version that's cut as slow as the VR version, it's really boring. And if and you, you're we're trained to cut a lot faster when we're watching television and movies and stuff like that. So it's uh, but VR right now it feels like you need to cut a little slower because people aren't used to it. Mm -hmm. So um, you also won an Emmy for Outstanding Innovation in Interactive Storytelling. Um, how did that come about? I didn't even know that category existed. <laughs> um, I didn't really either. Well, um, it's funny. I read an article today that the, that the Academy is talking about banning double dipping like we did, where if you get nominated for an Oscar, you're ineligible for an Emmy. Oh, really? Um, which is funny. I, I guess with Netflix and all that, it's happening a lot so more. He's a film guy. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, I, yeah, there's all kinds of stuff there. But um, I, I think, I, yeah, we didn't, you know, uh, David Eisenman, our producer on this, was awesome about uh, looking at these organizations, film festivals, award shows that were pushing on this new technology and wanting to embrace it. And, uh, entering us into these things. And we, I would go and, you know, present this, do this kind of talk to uh, a panel or a bunch of judges. And, um, you know, apparently that worked, that worked well. And yeah. And we have, um, you know, this pro got a lot of, a lot of attention. We got a couple of Annie's mm -hmm. and the Emmy and the Oscar nomination. It was amazing. I, and it's cool with the Annie's even that you get to nominate like the production design and, and uh, character, it's other other elements of the story yeah. that you know aren't typically recognized. Yeah, uh, you know. So yeah, well, I, I, just, I I was on a ride to be honest for that stuff. It was uh, David, our producer, who was able to kind of dig it out and, and find where we might be able to put on the show and impress people. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's interesting. Like even some of the submissions that we're starting to get for this year's VR theater, um, there are a couple pieces that. Are, are really trying to push it more. You know, it's getting much more experimental. People are trying to get a little more theatrical. And a lot of those apprehensions, you know, whether it's cutting or what can we show the audience, uh, a lot of people are starting to bend the rules. So that's pretty cool. Uh, have you thought about making another 360? Would you do it yes, again? I would, li I would like to. I think there's some really cool stuff to be done. Uh, there's a lot more creative tools in 360 now. There's you know, Quill and, uh, yeah. and uh, Tilt Brush, and there's a little indie thing called Anim VR, which is like a 2D animation, 2D, 3D, you know, drawing animation, frame by frame, and storyboarding tool is really what I think it's amazing for. And uh, so I, it, it's just, 
the weird thing about it is like until you have a plan, you shouldn't even think about how to do it because it's going to change. It'll change like every couple months. The tools that exist are just getting amazing and better. So it's almost like, uh, you know, think about that great story and then and then try to partner up with the right people to make some stuff. I, I've also been thinking a lot about uh, about uh, VR tech, but using it minus the headset. There's a lot of really cool stuff you can do with other ways of seeing the imagery and still have it be dimensional interactive uh, in, in a group thing, uh, which yeah. I think would be kind of neat. So uh, I've been playing around with stuff, but now I'm, it, you know, working at Blue Sky eight hours a day um mm -hmm. feature so it's which is awesome and that's where i am now but um so it's uh it's that's pretty time consuming yeah <laughs> and that's, oh, I imagine. That, it comes out in two years so it's kind of you know you, you can't i can't really think about doing more stuff so i'm just gonna let the technology go and then uh you know as we in a year or so when things start to like the future starts to get clearer. I, I maybe I'll jump into finding another one of those to do in some way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's interesting because you know a lot of people wonder, you know, what comes first? Should I be thinking, wow, that's a great movie in 360? Or you know, I, I see a lot of people struggling where they're trying to cram a movie into 360. Yeah. Um, how did Pearl work out that way? This, it was, this was a story built for the concept of the technology in the first place. The idea was it's a seated experience that you could, that would work well in 360 specifically because you could look around. Um, the idea, I mean, the original pitch to Google was that, like saying, like, it's like a giving tree, you know, Shel Silverstein book, but with the car. And then with that concept, you're like, well, how do you, you know, I think we, we cars are these heirlooms. They're the things you pass on. They're things that um, get destroyed by by your life with them. So there's like you have that pathos in it. There's like a really nice emotional uh, core, and we and we treat them different than other possessions. So it seemed like that you could get a giving tree style thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't end up doing anything where you're literally dismantling the car or wrecking it or anything. But there were versions of you know different owners and it goes, you know, ends up in the demolition derby and then as a, in the junkyard and then it's re, you know, refound and remade into a classic car and ends up like a, a booth seat in a restaurant. And uh -huh. each of those are different scenes. And I think that's fun. And we could have done something like that too. Um, but it's one of those things where the story kind of starts to tell you where it wants to go and you just let it happen. Um, the story was developed as we were playing with the technology. So it's kind of this, back and forth thing and I think all the best stuff is that and it's kind of more of its time that way also yeah. so uh, any teasers about the new feature anything you can tell yeah, us about it's, it it's like kind of known and announced so it's uh, it's Nimona it's a uh, it's a graphic novel adaptation by an amazing uh, author named Noelle Stevenson uh, Noelle is the showrunner of Netflix's She-Ra which is uh, in production now and I don't know when it's going to come out, but she's amazing and she's a great writer. And it's uh, written by Mark Hames, the movie version. And Mark is the guy who wrote Kubo and the Two Strings. Oh, okay, and, cool. Uh, he's, he's like right over there. <laughs> and uh, it's it's coming along great. I mean, um, Blue Sky is an amazing place with an incredible uh, you know, uh, group of people that are super talented. And we're having a lot of fun. Uh, figuring out how to adapt this book, which is a um, kind of a medieval fantasy, futuristic, you know, yeah. Blade Runner, Game of Thrones mashup, um, sword and sorcery, but, you know, fun and with a shapeshifter at the center who's this awesome uh, girl uh, sort of character. So we're having a lot of fun figuring out that it feels socially important. And um, I don't think there's any movie like it ever made. So I'm really having fun. Uh, digging into that cool so you're still in story dev then we're in the middle of yeah we're not animating yet but we are in uh doing another doing a lot of storyboarding and a lot of uh character building cool <laughs> so um any final words of advice to animators filmmakers out there that uh about getting their stuff out there you know getting getting in front of an audience and places like uh cigarette yeah well i, I feel like 
you know, the thing that's not really obvious maybe until you really get there is that there's like a huge hunger for interesting and creative projects that are good. And um, you don't really have to push on the festivals and, and every, they, they want the work. They want you to mm-hmm. do amazing, interesting stuff. And uh, if it's really great, it is, it's going to be pulled in. And the way to make it great is to actually care about it and actually think if you are someone outside and you like, why should you care about that project? Why, why, if you see this, is it something that you have to tell your friends about? Is it something that's going to blow you away? And if you can't even like do that about your own stuff, then you know, aim higher. Um, because, you know, it's making things has never been easier, but like coming up with the, the right thing to make is still hard and always going to be an incredible challenge. So I think the, uh, the biggest advice is to like to actually start making stuff and try and, and, and then when you feel like it's not good enough, you know, figure out why and make it better. <laughs> Fantastic. Patrick, thank you so much for taking some time out of your day. I know you're very busy developing your story and all. Best of luck with the feature. We really appreciate it. Um, right. yeah. I'd like to encourage all of our uh, viewers out there that um, you too could someday be in the Academy Awards or at least in the electronic theater. So check out our submissions right now. And um, thanks once again. Have a great afternoon, Patrick. All right. See you later. Thank you. Cheers.